But I think the reason I'm optimistic for the long run is that I also, in my lifetime, I'm, and I don't like to say this, but my lifetime has now spanned many decades, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And, uh, and in my lifetime, I've seen enough change to suggest that more change is possible. Yeah. You know, I've, uh, I was in World War II. Uh, I saw a victory there yeah. when it looked impossible. Yeah. I was in the civil rights movement, involved there for seven years, living in the South, and saw uh, marvelous developments and triumphs that nobody ever expected. I was in the movement against the war in Vietnam, and there too, you know, it seemed impossible, and, but the war finally ended, and, and we had a great movement against that war. And, uh, and also, maybe more important, uh, even today, as we are in the midst of, of a, a war, uh, a, a war which uh, is very depressing because we see no end to it, uh, and we see an administration in power which seems determined to have war after war after war in order to maintain American supremacy in the world. Yeah. And yet in the midst of this situation today, I see signs in the United States, and certainly all over the world, of people who are aware of what is happening and who do not go along with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're not going along with it doesn't mean that, that they have yet uh, succeeded in changing right. policy. Right. Howard, I want to go back to that, the whole question of war in, in just a moment. But before we, uh, uh, before we get there, and, and I think that what uh, I'm about to ask relates closely to it, you talk a lot uh, about the importance of what you call small acts that uh, do not receive national publicity and the way in which those acts uh, you know, show that there's a, a, something stirring underneath and mm -hmm. ultimately, cumulatively, cause people and the nation to change. And you've seen a lot of this in your own history. Mm -hmm. Why don't you elaborate that a bit? Yeah. When I was talking about that, <clears throat> I guess I was thinking primarily about my experience in the South. Yeah. Uh, moving to Atlanta, Georgia in 1956, uh, before there was a civil rights movement. Yeah. Well, yes, the Montgomery bus boycott yeah. had taken place. Yeah. But uh, now things were quiet, and uh, there was no real expectation of a tumultuous change in the South. But um, I saw in Atlanta signs of unrest, uh, of dissatisfaction. Uh, my students at Spelman College were qu quiet, reserved, polite, yeah. you might say controlled. Yeah. At the same time... It, was a, it wasn't as a women's college. It was a women's. Spelman yeah. College was a women's college. Yeah. At the same time, it was obvious that these students, although they were not yet breaking out of their controlled situation, had enormous resentment inside at the segregation in the South, at the humiliation that people of color endured every day in the South. And, uh, and they began to act in small ways that were not noticed. And I was involved with them. You know, they, uh, the Social Science Club at Spelman College decided uh, we'll try something small. We'll try desegregating the Atlanta Public Library. Yeah. 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 And they carried on a campaign, yeah. which ultimately succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. It was the kind of thing that didn't make headlines, that didn't right. like the sit-ins or freedom rides and so on. Yeah. But these little forays, yeah. and these later on I discovered, these were taking place all over the South. Yeah. Put another way, before the famous 1960s sit-ins, there were many sit-ins yeah. that didn't attract attention. Yeah. Before the yeah. Freedom Rides, right. there were attempts at Freedom Rides which didn't lead to anything big. Right. So I came to the conclusion that it's very important that people uh, engage in even the smallest of actions, even if they don't seem to bring any immediate results. Right. Because it's these small actions that build and build and build yeah. Yeah. and eventually come yeah. to fruition. Yeah. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.